Hi, welcome back. My name is Yinka Bikini. Hello, if this is the first time that we're meeting. Uh, this is the corner of the internet where I sneak a little bit of your time and tell you about a case, about a crime that has taken place. Uh, just so you know, I think this is the last week that we are playing catch up. I think from next week, we're gonna be back to telling you stories on the anniversary of them happening, which makes me really, really happy. Um, some housekeeping to get into before we start this week's episode, nothing too heavy. If you haven't seen How to Hire a Hitman, it is my two part true crime documentary that is on Channel 4, so you can watch that on all four. Um, also, I run a true crime Instagram that I'll link below in the description for your daily dose of true crime. I write mini stories over on there whenever I get the chance and uh, yeah we put bleh, we put 10 minutes on the clock and I tell you as much about a case as possible that's the whole thing with this YouTube channel subscribe if you like it tell a mate if you like it and you know post it on Instagram on your story and tag me and that will make my day and probably make me cry before we begin I want to show you something, not what's behind the camera, because that's a mess, yeah. This is the neat part of my dining room. But I am in such an indecisive mood today. I've got this, which is a Coke Zero that I've just, I've been addicted to McDonald's over the last weekend, so whatever. And then I was like, oh, that's, the, like, am I going to be hydrated? So then I got a bottle of water, and then I made myself a coffee. I don't know why I have this many liquids, but I wanted to flag it so that, if throughout this video you see me with different vessels, you know, it's not Ray J's beanie. Yinka's just got bare drinks. Anyway, without further ado, 10 minutes on the clock, please. And let's get into this week's case. I'm actually due to make new ones of these, so you get it live today. Shwa na 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 na. Shwa na na na, shwa na na na. Shwa na na na, shwa na na na. Shwa na na na, shwa na na na. The story of Joy Morgan is one that I think a lot of people might know it, but more people won't unless we follow the same people. Her case did gain a bit of attention online in the media, but it was only through actively researching what happened to her that I found out the truly disturbing details of this crime. Our story begins on December the 26th of 2018, and Joy, who was 20 at the time of her disappearance, attended the church celebration in Ilford in East London. She wasn't reported until more than a month later, on February the 7th, 2019. Her flatmates at uni, she was in a shared accommodation. She was a second year midwifery student at the University of Hertfordshire, and her flatmates hadn't seen her since Christmas. They became concerned and they reported her missing to the police. A man was arrested two days after that on February the 9th, 2019. A man who went to the same church as Joy. A man who in his initial interview told police that he had dropped Joy home after the celebration on Boxing Day. A man who was released and then re-arrested on February 26th and charged of her murder. His name is Shofar El Israel. Now on the very first time that Israel was arrested, he said that him and Joy were like a father and daughter type relationship, that he dropped her home and that was the last that he knew of it. However, on February 26th, when he was rearrested and he was charged with her murder, he admitted that he hadn't in fact driven Joy home on the 26th of December, but that she had stayed at his house for two nights uh, in his flat in Cricklewood and said that the only reason that he had lied is because it was against the church's rules for men and women who weren't married to be alone together and him and Joy were alone together. And Joy was even only at his flat because she was thinking of leaving the church. The church in question is called Israel United in Christ, which I am furthermore gonna to refer to as the IUIC, just for ease with my words that I have a limited amount per day that I can speak successfully. Joy found it online in 2016 after her dad had passed away. Once she joined the church, she did become distant with her family. I did a bit of research on the church, the organization, and it does seem pretty strict. The church does seem to have a hierarchy with women not having ranks in that hierarchy they're all called sisters and they have to refer to the men as sir 
Now I don't have time to go like into, into it, but Joy's little sisters are mixed race and the teachings of the church are such that you can't be an Israelite if you have a white dad. So she would call her mixed race siblings white devils. And Joy's mum says that she thinks Joy got swept up in it all, that she got carried away. And former members of the church have come out and I've watched a few videos. I'll link them and I'll put all the research that I've done on the church as well in the description because this is really, I'm really blanket statement in a lot here just to get, to get through it. But former members have said that distancing yourself from your family if they are non-believers is something that the IUIC uh, teaches that your family if they're not part of the organization are lost so you should cut them off or you're not going to go to heaven that their sins will be on you the IUIC said that the claims that they encourage their members to cut off their families are lies and some people have called them a cult they say they're not a cult I will put the reading and you can decide what they are for yourself but joy was a part of this church and she was heavily invested and a heavily devoted member of the congregation one of the things that i was curious about was how joy could have been gone for so long from the 26th of december to the 7th of february nobody reported her missing and the biggest sort of flag was how did her family not clock how did they not notice that she was missing but when i started reading into this case when i started researching it she was not estranged from her family but she was very distant her mum had spoken to her on christmas day she had tried to get her to come round i even read that she tried to get her to come round on boxing day and offered to pay for taxi fare or something but joy had said no so when joy wasn't seen for over a month her flatmates were the ones who alerted the police we're going to talk about why the church members didn't a little bit later but don't worry i haven't missed that bit out the church members did not report her missing to the police we're just going to unpack that later because i wrote it later in my script two days after she was last seen her number was removed from the church group chat joy's family did take part in appeals um they were on social media i remember seeing them uh, in early 2019 but the police didn't find any evidence that joy was still alive they also found no evidence that she wanted to leave the church so they assumed as i assume that somebody using her phone took her number out of the chat two days after she went missing when the police began their investigation joy's flatmates told them that she was a member of the iuic and the police began contacting other members of the congregation to see you know what they knew about joy if they had seen joy and trying to get a picture of her life and what kind of happened one of the people they contacted was 40 year old Shofar El Israel the second time he was arrested for her murder the officers had pulled him over in his car on the hard shoulder on the M25 and they stopped him and they were like you're being arrested on suspicion of the murder of Joy Morgan and his response was she's dead in a, in a questionable way and then he continued to say I just want to know if she's dead you know I'm very shocked by this he was put on trial for her murder at reading crown court in july of 2019 and all of this happened the arrest the charging the trial for her murder without joy's body being found he pled not guilty but the evidence given at trial really helps to paint the picture of what happened in this case and what happened in the story of joy morgan first the jury found out that joy had a good relationship with the church and the other members of the congregation she attended worship very regularly she had loads of friends in the church and she even saw israel as a father figure him and his wife would regularly give her lifts between her student accommodation and the church. It was like her second family. Once Joy's number was removed from the group chat, members of the church did try to contact her. Two went to her house when she failed to show up to church and one of those people was Shofar El Israel. Uh, the family was not contacted by the church. The police were not contacted by the church. We found out in the trial as well that it was his initial statement, Israel's initial statement that got him when he said that he had dropped joy home on december the 26th because that was a lie joy's house keys were found in his car once the police searched it when they had pulled him over on the m25 and joy's phone was found to have signaled from his flat he had two homes there was one in cricklewood which was a flat and then him and his wife uh, rented a house that was in luton i believe so his wife's in luton with the kids and he's with joy in the cricklewood flat 
he said that yes she was in his flat that she slept on his sofa and she was only there anyway because she was upset he said that she told him she had seen videos from former members of the IUIC that the claims from these people that what these people were saying in the videos had influenced her to want to leave the church he said that they spent the two days between the 26th and the 28th watching YouTube videos and then he took her home. But Joy Morgan's mobile phone was detected in his car, was around the Stevenage area. The prosecution argued that he was most likely looking for somewhere to dispose of her body when this was happening. That's what all the paths are leading to. The jury heard that chauffeur El Israel's car was picked up on cameras near Stevenage around the same time that Joy's phone had sent a signal from the same area on December the 28th. Now, over the next three days, he tried calling her. He went to her house several times to check up on her, but it was all part of his cover-up. The prosecution said that it was Israel who had removed her number from the group after he had killed her. He was found guilty of her murder. Now, the judge expressed his frustration at what he described as Israel's cruel and cowardly refusal to reveal the whereabouts of Joy's body. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 17 years and two months after that sentencing, Joy's remains were found. They were wrapped in black plastic bags and gaffer tape and traces of MDMA were found in her body. At her inquest, it was found that there was no evidence that she had taken the drug herself voluntarily, although traces of it were found in Israel's car. It was tough to rule on the cause of death. Joy's hyoid bone was broken, and that is a U-shaped bone which is in the neck, and it can be fractured. It is found to be fractured in, I believe it's one third of all homicides by strangulation, but there was nothing else to suggest that her neck had been compressed. There were no signs of her being shot. There were no signs of her being stabbed or being sexually assaulted. There was nothing that indicated a major head injury either, but suffocation couldn't be ruled out. The family of Joy Morgan did get some closure when her remains were found, but as for the cause of her death, and even the motivation behind it, there's only one person who knows and he isn't talking. And there you have it, as much as I can tell you on the case of Joy Morgan. I hope that you have felt inspired to have a little research and have a little dig around and, you know, get to know more on this story. I was gonna show you, I was gonna talk about the, the book uh, how to kill your family. I seem to have lost my copy the same way that I've lost my laptop, hence me using an iPad. Um, but yeah, I finished it and it was okay. <laughs> so yeah, the ending wasn't as amazing, as amazing as the rest of the book, which is a shame, but it was a good book. And if you are on holiday, which you're lucky because it's October, I can't believe you're going away. But if you're on holiday, then um, definitely that's a good holiday read. Dun dun learn, enter new novel. Uh, this is called Cinderella is Dead. Now, uh, you might not follow me on Instagram, but I am a huge uh, sci-fi and fantasy fan. Um, uh, obviously, Harry Potter is my f first true love. Um, but when it comes to fantasy and almost like, um, like teen literature, I, I love it like when I go to, to book, book shopping and then I go to the teen section I'm sure I'm being judged hopefully I look young enough that um, no one thinks that it's that weird but I don't really mind this is called Cinderella is dead and um, it's written by someone called Kaylin Bayron and um, basically it's set 200 years oh I forgot that this does that it's set 200 years after uh, Cinderella found her prince imagine if Cinderella was real there you go there, there it is so I'm gonna start reading this she's got really I like the cover art but yeah I'm gonna start reading this and I'm gonna tell you how it's going but kill your family it didn't it didn't end well for me it didn't and I'm sorry about this situation that's going on um, thank you for watching I will see you next week with another uh, installment from my true crime vault and yeah i hope you have a good week goodbye